gorgeous alien women on a distant planet in a galaxy far, far away, waging war with each other as well as threatening the Earth and all humanity with total destruction. Hasta la vista, baby. Murderous Martian monsters creating mayhem, chaos, and panic, striking fear and hysteria in the public on Main Street, USA. Even a big-time shootout between cops and robbers on some dark, seamy street corner in the constant test of wills between the good guys and the bad guys. That was the campy but creative mindset in the first half of the 20th century. The genius, the universe of pulp fiction writers during the golden age of storytelling. Pulp fiction. It was a fantastic avenue for anyone to escape the mundane routine of their daily life and go off into a world of gangsters and good guys, cowboys and cattlemen, spaceships and star travelers. For just one thin dime, anyone could read from the imaginative pens of some of the best American writers and storytellers of that thrilling era, the era of Pulp Fiction. Well, I think it's important that people really understand the importance and significance of the golden age of pulp fiction, 20s, 30s, 40s, and even beginning of 1950s. Because a lot of what people see right now and, and come to see in the various movie theaters, Indiana Jones, that's Doc Savage. You see Superman, he's the man of steel. Doc Savage was the man of bronze. You have the various comic book characters also of like Batman. All the characters that we talk about today, Batman and Spider-Man, those were comic books, and the editors of those magazines made up the names of the Batman and Superman. The superheroes that we see on film now, like Spider-Man, Batman, a few years ago, Superman, etc., all came from comic books. But the adventure pulps had characters that were almost comic book-like. The idea came from the pulps, like Buck Rogers was a pulp character. Buck Rogers is a very famous science fiction hero, and is he very different from Luke Skywalker or somebody? Not really. They're bigger than life heroes. So they're pulpy, they're comic booky, and they're cinematic. We look back now and we see Indiana Jones, for example. Well, Indiana Jones is the epitome of all these these pulp adventures. Well, the reason why George Lucas and Steven Spielberg did that is because they were so in love with these stories back when. I don't think there's a single science fiction blockbuster that's come out in the last 20 or 30 years that isn't directly derived in one way or another as, as inspiration from the pulp uh, magazines of the 20s and 30s and 40s. So, I venture to say that 90, 95% of the top blockbusters in Hollywood of today were based on the stories from the Golden Age, the pulp fiction of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. In setting the scene for when pulp fiction became most popular with the general public, World War I had been a terrible experience for Americans. The bloodshed and carnage on the battlefields of Europe had taken their toll, with uncounted tens of thousands of men who died and many more who came home badly mangled from the physical and mental ravages of war. Then, in the fateful autumn of 1929, the Great Crash sent stock prices plummeting. Banks failed, businesses collapsed, and millions became frustrated and unemployed practically overnight. By 1932, the full measure of the human misery that unemployment entailed meant that just about every household in America had no breadwinner, no income, and no hope. The world, as it had been known, was falling apart, and no one seemed capable of putting it back together, which caused massive dissension, protests, and rioting. People desperately wanted and needed to escape the realities of their own lives. Well, if you speak of life in the 30s and 40s, nobody had any life. 
everybody was unemployed. There are 15 million people unemployed in the United States out of 30 million people. It was terrible. And I, I saw my father crying on Cape Street because he had no money. Things weren't all rosy. People were having tough times. And who wants to read Anna Karenina where she has a long, depressing life and steps in front of a train? That's not what you want at a time like that. You want something where you have brave heroes on pirate ships, or you have the, the shadow solving crimes, or, or the phantom, or the radio adventures that people were listening to. That's what the pulp magazines were the equivalent of, of these. There's nothing wrong with escapism. You want to escape. It was the middle of the Depression. Nobody survived. Nobody had anything. My father was out of work for years. It was a terrible time. You people today don't understand what the Depression was like. My dad looked for work again and again over a period of eight years. So he was very sad, and he had a tough time raising the family. My mom never spent any money on herself except for reading three pulps, one, The Wonder Stories, Argosy, and Analog. After working as a secretary at a mill, that was her pleasure, was to come home, uh, fix supper for everyone, uh, serve my father, it was a different era back then, and then she would read her pulps. Then we fell in love with the stories. And when you're a young reader, a bored reader with a hard life or, or some any kind of um, tough times in your life, you don't want to wrestle sentence by sentence to try to figure out what Dostoevsky is talking about in this. You want to be swept away and just join the adventure that these people are in. And I wanted to go to these far off places. I wanted to explore alien worlds and that's where the pulp adventures took me. When I was nine years old, I fell in love with Buck Rogers. They caused me to be a very much alive. When I was 12 years old, I got a toy typewriter for Christmas and I began to write. And the first thing I wrote was a sequel to the Martian books of Ed Rice Burroughs. So you see, Burroughs came into my life very early because Burroughs told me to go to Mars and I went there I never came back. It wasn't until after World War I, and more especially during the Great Depression, that to satisfy the hunger and need of the masses to escape their harsh realities, there was literally an explosion of cheap magazines at every newsstand, containing a wide variety of spicy, fantastic, mind-boggling, fanciful tales, which was given the term Pulp Fiction. Pulp fiction was developed as a term because of the paper that was used to produce it. It was the cheapest pulp that was made from wood pulp and uh, to keep the price down. The pulp started at a nickel and a dime and 15 cents. It became very, very successful in the Depression era. I mean, here you could get 128 pages or 160 pages of wonderful storytelling by wonderful adventure and mystery writers. But in order to be able to do that, publishers needed to use very, very cheap materials, and the material that they used was pulp paper. Pulp fiction, or the pulps, dealt with all the, the classic genres. You had detective fiction, you had sports, you had westerns, you had adventure fiction. Uh, it wasn't until World War I that you started including additional uh, type of genres. Uh, like aviation, fiction in which you did escape, escapism fiction. In the Depression, if the audience, if they had a quarter to spend on a magazine, that was a lot, and you had to deliver them something that was worth a quarter, otherwise they wouldn't come back for the next issue. Money was scarce, and the entertainment for a lot of people was the pulp. You could read it, and then you could trade it to somebody else for one you haven't read. And a lot of the entertainment available to people who were out of work, which was a lot of people, or were afraid they would be, which is everybody else, uh, was because pulps were what they could afford. If you bought a magazine, they could trade it. 
the one thing that differentiated the pulp magazines from the slicks. Slick magazines would, if it was a detective magazine, uh, would have a lot of highbrow detective fiction. You had your Sherlock Holmes. In the pulp magazines, you had the down and dirty detectives. Uh, you had the Sam Spades the, of the world, what they called the uh, hard-boiled detectives, the gritty, the, the, the gin-drinking, the uh, women-abusing uh, toughs. That was, the, that was the Pulp Fiction era. I mean, the fascinating thing about the writers who were working in the pulps was that they were writing what was considered disposable fiction, trash. I mean, most of these stories, you'd read them and throw them out. And yet, the top writers in these fields, whether it's westerns or science fiction or horror or mystery, they're now considered the literary giants of the 20th century. But there's a kind of purity uh, of uh, entertainment that those writers had, which I think came from being the first, being unselfconscious, breaking new ground. They were pretty much making it up out of whole cloth as they went along. But to neglect those writers, to figure you won't find a lot of fun and entertainment would be to needlessly impoverish your reading. After all, people like modern adventure stories, but you can't beat Robert Louis Stevenson or Mark Twain. The pulp era is also a reflection on history. The pulps themselves were not written, obviously, in a vacuum. The authors were, were pulling stories out from the times that they were living in, uh, the down and dirty type of, of material. Those classic stories never go out of, out of vogue. I think if anybody wants to know something about the history of American literature in the 20th century, you would have to understand the pulps, because the pulps were the breeding ground for so many writers. It's where a beginning writer with very little experience. He could produce a lot of stories because there was this tremendous need for a lot of fiction. And many of them then went on to become far more important, far more serious writers than their work showed in the pulps. With the explosion of pulp fiction magazines during those difficult years in America, came the tremendous demand for writers of all kinds. And during those days, any work was better than no work at all. As things turned out, some of the 20th century's best-known authors got their start writing for the pulps. Writers like Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, Earl Stanley Gardner, L. Ron Hubbard, Carol John Daly, and Walter Gibson are only a few of the notables that handled such staples as action, adventure, westerns, and romance. They represented the greatest explosion of mass entertainment via the printed word that a thrill-seeking public had ever experienced. Other notable pulp magazines later specialized in topics such as science fiction. It was in these pulps that writers like Ray Bradbury, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein, and Fred Pohl first made their names. I was editing at the time. I was a boy editor. I got my first editorial job when I was 18. Uh, I had two magazines, one called Astonishing Stories and one called Super Science. Spent a lot of time as an editor of one thing or another. And uh, I was a literary agent for several years. At that time, I had no agent, and I sent my short stories to an agent named Fred Pohl. He hadn't begun to publish yet as an author, and he sent my stories back and refused to represent me. I try to forget about that. <laughs> uh, I was a pretty good literary agent, but I didn't manage to make a profit. I nearly went broke doing it. A lot of writers that we know today uh, as famous and important, significant literary figures got their start in the pulps. Uh, the most Obvious example are people like Raymond Chandler and uh, Earl Stanley Gardner and Dashiell Hammett. But there are other writers like Edgar Rice Burroughs who created Tarzan. That's where beginning writers would, would get their first material published. They made, no, they made very, very little money. The only way you could survive as a pulp writer 
was to write a lot of words. With the harsh economic conditions facing the whole country, these writers had an equally difficult time in balancing their writing with survival. They were all working without a guild or union, basically on their own, without advances, royalties, or residuals. Truthfully, most didn't make it, but some did. Back in 1939 and 1940, you got a half cent award, maybe a penny award, occasionally two cents a word, so there was not much money. And I, in my first story, I sold the thrilly wonder stories, and I got $15. And it made me very rich that week. I was selling newspapers on a street corner at the time, so I felt very rich and very famous. A lot of these magazines weren't in very good financial shape, and the editors couldn't even pay the authors after they had turned things in. I mean, Hugo Gernsback, the editor of Amazing Stories, was, was notorious. You would get paid a quarter cent a word on threat of lawsuit because people would turn in their stories, but he would make excuses and not pay for it. I think the public today should know about the pub fiction era because the money was so little that we couldn't survive. We had to have other jobs in order to be able to write for the Pulp Fiction. And all the magazines were not paying any decent money. So there's no way to survive. My first year, I made $15. The second year, I made $45 in the whole year. In the third year, I finally made $200 in the whole year. So I was poor for a long time. Pulp Fiction writers had a very, very hard time of it because they had to produce so much to earn even a small living. And one of the things that was uh, that perhaps not restricted to pulp writers, but to writers in general, was alcoholism. And a lot of pulp writers would sit down with their bottle of bourbon and drink and write and drink and write. And they some died early because of their alcoholism. Some died so poor that they vanished from the face of the earth. Nobody knows really what happened to them. The few that made it big are still read today and, uh, and much loved, but those are really the exceptions. In the 30s, to be a Pulp Fiction writer almost called for a lot of physical stamina because in order to make even a minimal living, you had to write about a million words a year. You had people like Murray Leinster, Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, who somehow, even in that frenetic, demanding uh, setting, did write stories which today are still a lot of fun. And one of the most prolific of those writers was L. Ron Hubbard. When I think of L. Ron Hubbard, the first thing, of course, I think of is he was one of the most successful pulp writers who ever lived. The true pulp writer, which L. Ron Hubbard was, is the kind of person who could write a detective story, a science fiction story, an adventure story, a spy story, a romance story. And he wrote all of those, and he did a very, very good job. He was really good at it. I never met L. Ron Hubbard, but I read his short stories in Unknown Worlds and loved them because he was a fine writer and went on to become very rich. Hubbard himself had 15 different pen names he used. Some of the magazines had three stories that he wrote under various pen names just so he could be able to keep up with his production output. He was able to write about 100,000 words a month as did some of the other major names of the time period because the whole idea during the, the Pulp Fiction era was um, if you worked, you survived. If you didn't work, you didn't. And it was the, it was the big names that actually continued to, to put it out and sell. And these guys would sometimes type and type and type until their fingers were raw. These guys had to go back to their typewriters and, and pound their fingers down to the knuckles just to get the stories done. And some writers even, they had to just write so furiously that they would put um, giant rolls of their own paper in the typewriter so that they didn't have the time to switch pages from one page to another. They just kept typing and typing and typing. I did 
the same sort of thing myself. I wrote for mysteries and horror and the love story magazines for teenage girls and anybody that would pay me a check. Uh, and some of the stories I liked very much. There have been other writers who have been as good and some of them better, but there are not very many who were able to do as many different things as Hubbard was. One thing about um, Aaron Hubbard as a writer, it was said his realism is what made his story sell so much. And what made it that way was because of the fact he was an accomplished pilot, because he was an, an accomplished seaman, he traveled all over the place. He did all types of explorations, climbing in, into volcanoes even at one point. As the torrent of Pulp Fiction magazines published at the time continued to burst forth, some magazine editors began to demand that writing be held to a consistently higher standard, imposing greater rigor and better storylines. For example, in 1939, one of the best writers of that period, John W. Campbell, was hired to edit the science fiction pulp Astounding Magazine. He had a scientific background as a student of nuclear physics. He told the best science fiction writers of the time to gear up and write more intelligent stories for a more intelligent readership. This was considered by many to be a huge development in science fiction writing and led to much more plausible and believable stories, combining real science facts with scientific discovery and developments just beyond the technological horizon of those days, which, in many cases, predicted several scientific breakthroughs decades later. That was the point when Heinlein, Hubbard, Asimov, de Camp, uh, Van Vogt all began as if freed from shackles, began writing sophisticated, intelligent f fiction, which happened to be science fiction. And the field never looked back. I spent a good many years as a science fiction magazine editor. And a lot of what I was good at at it, I learned from John Campbell. John Campbell said once that when he was new in the job, he asked his boss, the head editor at Street and Smith, what he did if he didn't have enough stories to fill an issue. Fill an issue. And the boss said to him, John, if you're a good editor, you always have enough stories. It was really a, a community at that point, uh, back then, of Sturgeon and Ray Bradbury and L. Ron Hubbard and Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke. It was a club, and they hung out together, they bounced ideas off each other. Uh, the magazines were basically our window looking into their clubhouse of imagination and, uh, and excitement. Science fiction became more than just a sub-genre of the pulps. It became an important entity unto itself. It was a harbinger, a precursor, a messenger of what might happen in the future of mankind. It offered an examination and a crystal ball of possibility. It almost taught science to the scientist it made futurists out of scientists, whose thoughts opened up new potentials, new aspects of hard science. And from there you have the movie makers starting to make the films which show those possibilities. And all of a sudden the larger population says, well, you know, maybe humanity is something greater than just the day-to-day -day struggle for survival and standing in bread lines and struggling for a job. Maybe we can be more as a race than just the day-to-day -day, um, striving. To, uh, to eat and procreate. And I think without these pulp magazines, you know, we may not have gone to the moon, we may not have these wonderful adventures. Mankind would, would not, I think, be as great as it has become, thanks to these, uh, these, these works of, of, of fantasy and science fiction. L. Ron Hubbard stated that science fiction was a herald of possibility. And this is a paraphrase, but it preceded the scientists and wondering, huh, can I do that or not? So you had the writers of the golden age of science fiction that were dreaming that dream. What if man made it to the moon? What if he made it to the stars? And they were thinking those ideas and conceiving those thoughts. Hubbard, of course, is one of the biggest names connected with that whole golden age of science fiction. No examination of the pulp fiction era could possibly be complete without looking at the unique artwork used for the covers.
Although the paper for the pages in between the covers was low quality, the covers themselves were beautifully illustrated original art, many masterpieces, paintings oftentimes featuring enticingly lurid portraits of pretty women in various stages of trouble and undress, along with the handsome men attempting to rescue them. Or, sometimes, the sci-fi pulps would showcase spectacular art introducing bizarre aliens on distant planets or valiant space explorers traveling the stars. I love the cover art of the pulps. Artists like Frank R. Paul and Virgil Finlay and Hannes Bach and, uh, and, and Frank Kelly Fries. Uh, these, these guys are just astonishing artists and so imaginative. And, and yet they were doing it you know, for, for low rates. In fact, I have many friends of mine who are artists uh, and, and, and set designers and concept designers for movies and television shows. And that's what they go back to. They're constantly cribbing from, from Frank Kelly Fries and Hannes Bach and Virgil Finlay and, and, and Frank R. Paul because uh, these guys are just brilliant. For the illustrators who were creating the covers back in the pulp era, as well as for the publishers, it must have truly been an absolute nightmare. Because even though the pulp material used for the covers was better in quality than the magazine's interior paper, it was still the mulch material from surplus lumber, and it had a very dodgy effect on the inks used in those days. The absorption rate dulled the, the reds, the blues, the primary colors. So the illustrators compensated for that by adding brighter, more garish colors um, to compensate for the printing. So you end, what you ended up with was very bright primary colors because everything else otherwise went to grays and washed out. And I'm sure the, the editors loved that because it got uh, more people's attention to the, to the newsstands. Look at the cover paintings of some of these. It's just lush and, and imaginative explosion of incredible things. And as a little kid who was living in, in a boring life, and I wanted to, you know, I had thick glasses and I couldn't play baseball, and, and I would just daydream about stuff. Looking at the pictures on the covers of these made me want to read the stories about the strange civilization buried in the moon or the, uh, the people that found a cave that took them to the center of the earth. It just, it made the whole world seem like an incredible place to explore. Back in the pulp era, some of the illustrators had the opportunity to uh, just do an illustration, and then the editors would go in and say, okay, you writers, Robert Silverberg, all, all the wonderful Isaac Asimov, um, came in, looked at the covers, and then wrote a story around them. After World War II and the beginnings of better economic times for most Americans, the pulps began to lose their traction with the masses. This started their decline in popularity, gradually giving way to other forms of entertainment. When we talk about the decline of the pulps, there are a lot of reasons for it, but uh, the overwhelming cause of the, the death of the pulps was the, uh, the advent of the mass market paperback. Now, Films were very popular in the Depression era, and when radio was also very, very popular for many, many years. TV came along. Everything nibbled away at it. Once you have lots of choices for your entertainment time, entertainment dollar, uh, then you could see where there'd be a little nibbling at the edges. But really, it was the mass market paperback that doomed pulps. Many of the pulp publishing companies simply closed their doors, while others, like the Spicy Group, went from publishing pulps into comic books. And although comic books eventually sold in the multi-millions after World War II, the publishing companies still put out the old-style pulps because they were so much cheaper to produce. The pulp publishers spent less on their paper so it was a much cheaper uh, avenue to, to continue, which is why they, they did, and some of them eked out a living until uh, the very end. But by and large, the, the magazines um, started dropping off the newsstands uh, in the uh, mid to late 50s and was completely gone uh, by the early 60s. As the pulp fiction magazines consolidated or closed down entirely, 
only the best of those riders who had proven themselves under the harshest of conditions and in the fiercest of competition could still keep on publishing. Those talented scribes went on to write some of the most memorable mystery, western, and science fiction literature of the 20th century by turning out full-length novels as well as contributing to mainstream magazines. Some writers even evolved from pulp literature into the newer field of broadcasting, writing for the popular radio and television shows of the 1940s and 50s. Young science fiction writers, Ray Bradbury. A lot of the authors from the pulp magazines that were very successful did transition in the 1950s to writing actual books, that they would write things that were, were frequently serialized in the magazines first, and then they were collected and, and released as either paperbacks or special press editions. Isaac Asimov, L. Ron Hubbard, Robert Heinlein, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, Ray Bradbury. These writers have become very well known. They're classics in the genre. They're considered the grand masters. I found a place in UCLA in the library basement where I could have a typewriter for 10 cents a half an hour. I needed an office, so I moved into the basement of the UCLA library. I spent $9.80 in dimes, and I wrote Fahrenheit 451 in nine days. It's beautiful to think what I did because I was in a library, you see, and being excited, running up and down stairs and writing Fahrenheit 451. For many years after the decline and fall of the Pulp Fiction era, literally millions of Pulp Fiction magazines were destroyed or thrown away out of sheer neglect. And of the 50,000 or so original paintings made for the Pulps, less than 900 remain intact today. As a rather cruel example, in 1961, when the Condé Nast Company bought out Street and Smith, an old pulp publisher. It inherited several hundreds of these original cover art paintings. And at an auction, there was not a single offer on a single painting. To add insult to injury, not one employee even wanted any of them as gifts. So they were all simply thrown into the trash, discarded and destroyed. Original paintings that would be priceless on today's market. Similarly, the pulp writers of the era were generally forgotten and neglected, until a resurgence of interest began in the 1980s and 90s, not only for the old artwork and magazines, but also a fresh appreciation for the writers themselves and their extraordinary storytelling skills. For magazines that originally sold for as little as 10 cents and as much as 20, 25 cents. The magazines now though, because they are so few and most of them were claimed in either World War I or World War II paper drives. So you can find magazines now that sell for 500, 700, 1,000 dollars. Like the original October 1912 All Story, which included the very first Tarzan of the Apes. Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, I've seen um, sold recently in auctions for as much as $50,000. Pulp Fiction is coming back in two different ways. One is that the great classic stories that were published in the pulps in uh, that era between the two world wars, especially when they had their, their most successful time, and are very, very popular, both with nostalgic old guys who read them then and liked going back to that era, as well as kids, young people, who were finding that the, uh, the excitement and the fast movement of those stories is very appealing to them. Conservatively, I'd say there's about 15,000 uh, pulp magazines uh, currently in my inventory. As far as, as uh, between selling original pulps and reprints and everything else, Literally, there is, is tens of thousands of, uh, that go through um, my hands uh, in any given year or two. We're definitely experiencing a resurgence in sales of these stories right now. Possibly it's because of the current state of affairs of the economy, the similarity between the Depression, the 20s, 30s, and 40s, when 
you know, the economy's collapse. There was, um, you know, the various problems with unemployment. You have those same things going on right now. But there's also maybe a return to what those stories had to say, you know, and how they had to say it. You had a simple storyline. They were a, maybe a word that's not used so much these days, moralistic, you know, without being moralistic. I'm the editor of a large number of anthologies. The Black Lizard Big Book of Pulps is a gigantic anthology of pulp fiction from the golden era of pulp magazines. They're crime stories by the very famous writers like Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Cornell Woolrich, Earl Stanley Gardner, and some very obscure writers who have fallen into neglect and uh, obscurity. The Black Lizard Big Book of Pulps actually made the New York Times bestseller list, the extended list, a couple of times. People started really enjoying it, it hit the bestseller list, and it's because people were picking up this material and reading it for the first time, and that's the, the, the best thing about reading Pulp Fiction is, yes, it could be kind of dated. It can be talking about phone lines that uh, you have to spin the dial or get the operator to connect you to uh, Oliver 212 or whatever, uh, but that is, that's just part of the, the, the charm uh, of, of, of the fiction itself. One thing about Ellen Hubbard as a writer, and why we're so successful now with the stories from the Golden Age line of books, now, because people are finding that they're transported to another time, another place, the people are very real because that's what he actually put his attention on. Created those dramas that are just as real now as they were back then when he wrote them. The renewed interest in Pulp Fiction that, is, that has been occurring for the last few years is simply, I think, a recognition that this kind of story, this pure entertainment, has a lot of value. People were tired of reading what I call the New Yorker story, which is a beautifully written, beautifully crafted story with no story. There's no arc, there's no beginning, middle, and end. Pulp fiction grabs you by the throat, drags you along, yeah. makes you read it, makes you turn the page, and I think that's a very attractive concept or notion when you go to pick up a book and you want to have a good time reading it. The legacy of the Pulp Fiction era can still be seen today as the style that these early writers developed has been picked up and passed on to the current generation of writers. Pulp Fiction is also coming back with younger writers who are writing their own stories in a very pulp-like style which is not heavily reliant on characterization or the nuance of background and language, but is action-oriented and moves forward at a rapid pace. I wrote Twilight Zone Companion, and so I spent a number of years writing about Rod Serling's creation, and of course that directly came from the pulps. He read those stories. He grew up reading, you know, Astounding and Amazing and, and all the great pulp magazines. He was very conversant with that. And so a lot of the stories that became the great Twilight Zone stories came from the pulps. And then, of course, the people who watched the Twilight Zone, then they created Star Trek and so on and so forth. Some of these pulp fiction era writers personally helped new writers get their start to ensure that promising young writers get the exposure they deserve. And their influence is obvious in what we all see today. The answer to helping writers is to set them examples and to tell them what to do. I have a saying, do what you write and write, love what you write and write what you love. And don't think about writing, jump off the cliff and build your wings on the way down. And that's the way I help young writers. That's what I teach to young writers. You must be in love what you do. It must never be for money. If it's for money, forget it. You'll never make it. Ray Bradbury is a, is a figure unlike, unlike most people in American letters. His generosity is almost unquantifiable. He will show up at everything. He will help writers. Uh, I know of at least two writers whose very first books, he, would take, he took the manuscripts and helped them rewrite it. This is something he didn't need to do. Like Ray Bradbury, other Pulp Fiction-era writers also helped young writers in many other ways. 
There's one particular story that for me um, characterizes L. Ron Hubbard, not as just as a writer, but also what he eventually created is um, when he went on his, his expedition with the Explorers Club to Ketchikan, Alaska, he created a writing contest. And he started his own Golden Pen Award that he launched where any of the local people could then enter a story and he would personally judge it. And the winner, he would give uh, his contacts in New York for them to be able to get their career started as a writer. The one thing about Pulp Fiction era uh, that you don't have today is it's, uh, it's actually quite regrettable because uh, authors today don't have uh, the same avenue that uh, they had in the past. You didn't have the ability to write to literally hundreds of magazines or send your stories out. That doesn't exist nowadays. So a lot of uh, new writers are finding it very, very difficult to, to find uh, their voices or finding those readers. As a continuation of what Mr. Hubbard did, in 1983, he conceived a contest called Writers of the Future, which has since become the most established, the most successful writing contest of its kind in the world. And the reason why almost every major writer and artist of science fiction, fantasy, alternate history, horror, participate in this as its judges is because they see the, the value of it and the importance of it paying forward and creating a future for all those genres of speculative fiction. It was about 20 years ago that Algis Budris, a very respected science fiction writer, asked me if I'd be interested in being a judge uh, for this relatively new contest, Writers of the Future. And I looked at the other judges he had also asked, and it was writers of way bigger magnitude than me. And so I was very happy to uh, jump aboard. And it's been very rewarding in that this contest exists to take unpublished writers, unheard of writers, and make them published and heard of. I think Writers of the Future has been a great thing for new writers. When I come across a writer who hasn't been published, I say, have you ever submitted to Writers of the Future? Because it is your best chance of having a lot of people know who you are and getting published in the book they do every year. I think for almost all of them, that has been a positive effect on their careers. Still recommend it to any new writer who is having trouble getting published because uh, it's a good way to do it. As illustrations and artwork has always been an integral and inseparable part of Pulp Fiction, shortly after the creation of the Writers of the Future contest, the event expanded to include an Illustrators of the Future award as well. Ron and I started out uh, as judges at the very beginning of the L. Ron Hubbard um, contest for the Illustrators, which started a few years after the Writers' Contest. And from there, uh, we developed a workshop um, for, for a few days. We can disseminate so much useful information on art directors, uh, publishing houses, um, techniques. They, the winners already know how to draw, so we give them information that can help their careers. There is no question that the old-time Pulp Fiction writers shaped American culture. They invented iconic characters who live on in our collective hearts and imaginations. Even popular literature, from best-selling authors to underground wordsmiths, owes a lot to the pulps as the breeding ground for so many authors. The pulps gave rise to inventors of such beloved genres as the Western, hard-boiled detective, spy thriller, science fiction, horror, legal thriller, crime fiction, and romance. And they are still around in a number of different forms. The Pulp Fiction magazines themselves transitioned and evolved and have faded away, but the Pulp Fiction era itself just evolved and changed. The whole philosophy, the whole mindset of, of a 
wonderful escapism, taking you away to amazing places, is certainly alive and well. I mean, I, I think you would look in the movie theaters and, and look at Star Wars is a perfect example. It's a movie, but it is just unabashed pulp science fiction. And Indiana Jones is unabashed pulp entertainment. A lot of those stories are still around. All the stuff that I wrote for Word Tales, $15 a story, are still around in Dark Carnival, and the October Country, which is still around today. Those are all pulp stories that I wrote when I was 21, 22, 23, and 24 years old. Golden Age of Science Fiction may have been in the late 30s and early 40s. Other people have said the golden age of science fiction is when you're 12, and that may be true also. So in a sense, that was the golden age, but I would not have missed it for anything. Pulp fiction is always still around because people need that kind of entertainment. And as a writer who is maybe the second, third, fourth generation um, from these people who created a lot of the stuff, I'm glad to continue providing some of the entertainment for that. There is a renaissance of sorts today for the Pulp Fiction era, with not only renewed interest in collecting the old Pulp Fiction magazines, as well as stories reprinted into anthologies, but also current generations of storytellers are writing in the old Pulp Fiction styles. With such a surge of interest in these Pulp Fiction writings, a publishing company is even transitioning the stories of Pulp Fiction heavyweight L. Ron Hubbard, applying the latest technological advances. This includes the conversion of his stories onto audiobook CDs, putting them onto iTunes and iPods, and preparing for the next generation of entertainment in an effort to get and keep all generations interested, just like they were during the original pulp era of the 20s, 30s, and 40s. My orders is that we get this to Shunkeen on Saturday. So when we created these audiobooks along the lines of the radio theater of the 30s and 40s, it brought a whole new dimension to storytelling because they are so able to convey that and transport you to that uh, time period. Whatever format we're going to have down the road with, with stories, I know that Mr. Hubbard's books are still going to be part of that because they rely on the people. It's this person dealing with this person, and that doesn't change over time. These Pulp Fiction writers of the golden age of storytelling still live on in our collective hearts and imaginations. People would go to see Star Wars and Star Trek, and they had no idea where, where these things had come from. That, that if not for John Campbell and Astounding or Hugo Gernsback and Amazing, uh, you wouldn't have Star Trek, you wouldn't have Star Wars. And they, they were the revolutionaries. And uh, sometimes when you're starting out as a revolutionary, it's a revolution of one. U ultimately, you're going to turn the world to see what you see. And that's what these guys do. Whether a brand name legend or an obscure forgotten author, the Pulp Fiction era represented a treasure trove of the craft of writing. Learning about its joys and its secrets is equally satisfying for historians, students, fans of pop culture, and yes, even serious readers of literature. You know, when, when, you, when you're writing for the love of it, it's all consuming. You don't have a choice. I mean, you know, you, I mean, you have uh, everything else that you do in your life is feeding that. They didn't have a choice, these guys. They just were bursting with creativity and love and imagination. I'm so glad the writing that these men did in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s and the 50s is still with us, to be enjoyed, to be cherished, to be um, something we can pass on to our children and grandchildren. Great pink plots where heroes dare Make you feel though you were there Characters jump out from the page Stories from the golden age Westerns from the Texas plains To real you feel you're at the range Bullets flying fast and not better Dodge the lead or you might get shot But stories from the golden Page to page, they're big and bold. They must be told stories from the golden age.
set on planets far Start your journey to a star Creative tales of future worlds Shaping while tomorrow holds Adventures from the seven seas To live as you may feel the breeze Buccaneers who fight for glory Drawing you into the story My star is from the golden age Compelling you from face to face Stories from